Good. Good afternoon, everybody. It's just before two. Uh, we are going to start dead on two, but uh, just thought I'd come in a little bit early and say welcome. It's a beautiful day today and it's uh, nice to be joining you uh, on this sunny afternoon. Um, and we are recording today, so just a little bit to tell you and you should be able to see our slides and you should also be able to see the live chat function on the right hand side. So just get a bit familiar um, with the different platforms that we're all coping with Zoom, WebEx, Teams, everybody's coping with different platforms, aren't they? So it, it can be really complicated because they all look slightly different, don't they? So um, I know I, I empathise with you and usually my trauma is trying to get in and worrying about it, so I can empathise. OK, we'll start if that's all right. So welcome, welcome to our third My HPC HCPC standard session today. Uh, we are starting at two and we will finish at about 10 to three. So we want to give you some time to have a break quick, quickly before you perhaps see your next patient or perhaps go to your next meeting. Uh, it's really great of you to join us for our third session. We've um, put up on the internet the other two, so you should be able to re look, watch those if you want to. Um, but we're hoping that it's going to be a fun session this afternoon, quite interactive. We'll be doing some polling. We'll be doing some question answering in our chat. And we've got my two lovely colleagues with us who I'll introduce in a minute who will be answering your questions and talking about some case studies. So I'm hoping you're going to really enjoy it. Um, so let me just, uh, you will see me to look slightly to the side where I'm going to be looking on my other screen, so I do apologise for that, or on my phone where I'm going to be doing the polling app. Uh, so this is what we're going to be covering uh, this afternoon. We're going to look at the HCPC role and standards. We're going to look at standard three specifically, and we're going to look at scope of practice. This is a really big one. We get a lot of queries about scope of practice, and we're also going to be looking at the importance of giving and receiving feedback because we think that that's really useful to you. I hope that's really useful to you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start um, and then I'll introduce myself a little bit more. So as I said, the session is going to be recorded. Um, you can use the chat box on the right hand side, which is really useful. You can also use the chat box in the, in the polling app, but we prefer if, if it's OK with you just to keep it onto the right hand side ones and we will answer your questions as we go on. We will be pausing during the session just to answer your questions. The slides will be made available to you after the event. They will come probably in PDF version because they're quite difficult. They're quite big. Um, and no need to keep notes. You can revisit it. You can watch it if you like. We will be using Slido, the polling app. So do if you've got a chance now just to look down onto your phone or your computer and just type into Google, Google, Google Slido. We will be using that. But before we start, just to introduce myself. So my name's Kim Tolley. I'm a professional liaison um, consultant at the HCPC and I've been at the HCPC for about a month now actually, used to work at the General Medical Council. I'm a nurse by profession, um, an intensive care nurse by profession and, um, and a nurse teacher. That's my background. So hello, my name is. But just a bit of background about that and I actually don't apologise for the fact that I repeat this at every webinar that I do. Hello, my name is was a fantastic initiative um, started by Dr Kate Granger and I know that the lovely Holly will probably put her um, link onto the chat box, but she was a fantastic elderly care consultant who unfortunately died a couple of years ago now of a very rare sarcoma. Um, while she was a patient, she tweeted and blogged and wrote and shared her personal experiences of being a patient, and they really were personal experiences. Um, if any of you have ever been patients, you will have lots of stories to tell, and she wrote about her stories. Um, she found really concerningly that she noticed that in fact when people coming into a room they weren't introducing themselves to her and we, she was automatically supposed to know who they were. Now she was lucky because she could identify a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist or a nurse by their uniform and even she could probably identify the different grades of nurses by their uniform but she was really concerned that nobody else would be able to and in fact the only person and I, again I always say this because I think it's amazing that the only person who introduced themselves to her was the porter who was wheeling her to x-ray. So she started this amazing campaign called Hello My Name Is. She also talked actually about the little things that really matter to patients which I think are really important but have a good read of her blog and you'll find that really interesting. So she encouraged staff to say Hello My Name Is and a lot of staff have got Hello My Name Is badges. I've got my Hello My Name Is um, badge that when I work in intensive care um, and I'm really proud of that. So hello, my name's Kim and I'm going to be facilitating your session today. And I'm going to ask Olivia and Holly, who are my colleagues, just to introduce themselves as well, if you don't mind. So Olivia first, if you don't mind. Yep. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name's Olivia Bird and I'm a policy manager in our policy and standards team. So a key part of my role is reviewing and setting the standards that we're going to be talking about today. And the team also take questions from registrants about how the standards apply to their practice. So 
that's where I'm helping Kim out today and answering um, questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Olivia. Busy job. Thank you. Holly and Holly's here, our events and communications officer. Holly. Yeah, hi, thanks, Kim. Yeah, my name's Holly and I'm the events and communications officer at the HCPC. Uh, so I help to uh, organise all of the events and I was the one sending you various emails. Um, <laughs> and I have the communications team with uh, different projects as well. Thank you, Holly. And you wrote the excellent My Stories on our website, which I think are really good. So we'll talk about those later, actually. OK, a little bit about GDPR. You will have all done your uh, data protection training, I know, but a bit just to remind everybody that your name does come up in, in the chat box. So if you do want to ask any questions, your name will be there um, and that may remain in the recording. But just to let you know, we only use your data um, that you send us when you register for this webinar to uh, to contact you about the webinar. We don't use it for any other purposes, um, but we will be sending you a survey after the webinar and you can then download, once you've completed the survey, uh, the carrot is you can then download download a certificate that you can use for your CPD. So Holly's uh, fantastically organising all that for us. So there is a certificate available after today. So we hope that'll be useful to you. So um, a little bit about voting. We've you've used this a couple of times with you and we find it really useful and we hope that it's fun for you as well. We want to ask you a few questions. Um, now, it's really helpful for us if you can answer honestly these questions because um, we find it really useful because we can actually use it for our data to see whether this these uh, seminars and these standard sessions are useful. So I'm going to be looking at my phone um, just briefly. So I do apologise for that. It means I look down on my phone and because I control the moving between the polling app with my phone. So my apologies for that. So my first question to you, if you don't mind, is going to be what professional group do you belong to? Now, some of these will go off your screen probably because they go down. There's obviously 15 professional groups uh, that are covered by the ACPC, um, but it's really nice for us to see. Uh, who you are and who's in the room, so to speak. Now, if we were standing, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it? If we were standing talking, it would be amazing, but actually we're not. So unfortunately, we're stuck here at home in our virtual worlds at the moment. Um, as we all are, we'd love to be in a room with you presenting these se these sessions. And eventually, hopefully we will be. Um, but it's really nice for us to see who's in the room. So if you could just do that if possible. There is a small delay between what you can see, maybe sometimes between what I can see, and it's all related to it, I think, going up to some satellite and coming back down from a satellite from what I can gather. But I can see there's quite a lot of paramedics here, some biomedical sciences. Gosh, you've been busy during the pandemic. Both those groups well, have all been busy, but particularly I can imagine biomedical sciences. It's, it's massive. Uh, all some occupational therapists, some psychologists. Interesting, we didn't have any psychologists last time, so thank you for joining. Some amazing art therapists. Um, I was going around doing flu, flu vaccinations uh, in my local hospital the other day and uh, I met some play and art therapists in the children's department who were talking to me about what they do for children. It's, it's incredible. I know that's not just the only place you work in, but um, it was really useful. So thank you very much for that. I know a few votes will probably be coming in a minute, but you've given us a real feel for actually there's quite a lot of occupational therapists here today. So thank you very much. Um, OK, thank you very much for that data. It just helps us really frame the session, if you don't mind. Now, this is another question. When you think of the HCPC, what word comes to mind? So if you could type in just one word again, this really helps us because actually we need to know you're our customers, you're you're our customer base, really. We, we need to know what you think of us. So please do be honest. Um, I have to say before I worked, worked worked for a regulator, I'm actually not sure I even understood what the regulator did. Uh, obviously, I'm regulated by the NMC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Um, it's nice to think that you've got that word regulation. That is exactly what we do. Um, the HCPC do regulate you as a um, healthcare professional. Um, we write the standards that underpin education. We um, keep the register of you. We um, write our standards that Olivia does. And we also um, are, that's our job for fitness to practice as well. So we do do all those things. Um, and I can see that you've got most of them there actually. Pride, that's nice that you feel pride in your regulator. Um, professional regulation, we're informative. I hope that we are. And uh, yeah, I can see somebody's put fear and I can totally get that. And when I mentioned that word fitness to practice, perhaps that's the word that suddenly came to mind for you. And we do understand that as well. And that's what today's partly about is us talking about and sort of demystifying some of the things that 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 are, are, are actually our role and our job under the law. But thank you very much for that. That's fantastic. That really, really helps me um, see that we're doing the right thing and we're talking about the right thing. Um, so one more question. 
um, actually, no, we'll leave that question for a second. Actually, we'll move on to the next slide. So this is um, our role. I just talked about it, didn't I, briefly? Education, registration, um, standards and guidance and fitness to practice. Those sort of four key things of our role, really. And that's in the Medical Act, or sorry, the Medical Act, the order. The order, um, that was my a bit bit back from the General Medical Council, so I do apologise for that. So we write standards of education and training that underpin your pre-registration standards in the UK. We write about your continuing professional development and your registration in our orange booklet. In our blue booklets, you've got a blue booklet for every profession uh, that's covered by the HCPC. Um, and in our lovely red document, it's all about our standards and guidance. And uh, that's the bit we're going to be talking about today, really. And that's the bit that focusing on these webinars. And that's the bit that's really useful to you because they outline standards of standards of conduct, performance and ethics that actually the public expect of you. OK, so I'm going to ask you a question. We're going to look today um, at the third standard, um, the third standard. It's called scope. I already talked what we we're going to look at and I'm going to ask you to in your whoops here we go in your your voting if you don't mind how would you rate your current knowledge of under, knowledge and understanding of standard three now that means for example do you know how many parts there are of standard three even if there are parts do you know how many parts within the parts there are do you know what it says in that scope of practice bit? And do you understand exactly what it means for you as healthcare professionals? So this is good, actually. There's a, there's a few people saying good, and there's a few people saying not so good, and that's fine as well. So we've got a real range in the room, and that, and that would be exactly the same for me, uh, for my NMC um, standards and guidance. So thank you very much for that. That's brilliant. I'm going to just click off that in a second if that's all right. We've got a few more people voting, so I might just hang about there if you don't mind. It is important to us because what we're getting the feeling of is that people may not be so, um, may not have a good grasp of what actually the HCP standards say. And actually what these whole webinars is all about is about demystifying, making it real, making you really appreciate what actually your standards you are guided guided by really so thank you that's brilliant I'm going to stop that now if you don't mind and, and uh, you can see from those results that it, there's a there's a bit of a mix so fantastic let's go past the voting for a second um, so standard three has actually got two bits <laughs> all right so it's keeping with you in your scope of practice and maintaining and developing your knowledge and skills all right so it's got two sort of parts and we're going to look at both those parts during our session but we're really going to focus on scope and we're really going to focus on feedback on that second part really I think that's what we're going to do. We've, we had a long think about it. And we thought that might be the most useful to you. OK, so the first one, the scope of practice has actually two parts within it. Um, and the bits are you must keep within your scope of practice practice by only practicing in the areas which you have the appropriate knowledge, skills and experience for. So three things, knowledge, skills and experience. They're really important. All right. And if you can't care for a patient within your scope of practice, you've got to refer them to another 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 sort of treatment or another service provider if it's beyond your scope of practice. That's pretty clear, isn't it, really? So the way we thought we'd frame this session is that we would share with you a few case studies. Now, Olivia already mentions that she runs the inquiry sort of line and you can get um, you can actually send in any questions or queries you've got the, for the HCPC to our standards colleagues. And Olivia is one of them uh, and she's the sort of head head one um, and she knows all about the answers. So what we did was we interrogated that list of questions that come in and we found some of the really common ones that are coming in at the moment. And we thought it might be really useful to share those with you. And then Olivia and I can answer what the answer would be. OK, so the first one. So I'm Susan. I'm a registered occupational therapist. There's quite a lot of occupational therapists on the lines. So that's actually really topical. Um, I've been asked to support with the upcoming flu vaccination campaign by giving vaccinations. Can I undertake this role? Now, very topical one. Lots about flu on the news at the moment, not just the COVID pandemic, but actually about the flu vaccination. So, Olivia, I'm going to come to you because you've had this a couple of times or quite a few times, haven't you? What would you say to yeah. Susan? Yeah, thanks. It, it is a really topical um, issue and we are getting lots of lots of questions about this, whether it be about flu vaccines or, um, of course, there's lots of coverage at the moment about a possible COVID-19 vaccine in the future. Um, I guess the key starting point um, for Susan and advising Susan would be to look at the law because uh, flu vaccines and any vaccines, they are prescription only medicines. And so there are some certain legal rules around which professions can and can't administer the vaccines and in what ways. Um, so because Susan is an occupational therapist, um, she does have um, rights to administer via 
patient group directions and PGDs, which is a common way in which vaccines are administered. It's essentially an instruction by a prescriber to a named individual to give a particular medicine to a, a group of people. So it's kind of well suited to vaccination campaigns. And um, so that would always be the starting point. Um, is Susan legally able to? And, and she is um, using that mechanism. Um, the next step would then be whether it's something which Susan has been uh, trained to do um, and is supported by her employer to do. So that would be looking at her current level of skills and experience, but also looking at things like the indemnity arrangement in place with her employer um, or that Susan might have herself if she's um, not directly employed. So all of those um, would need to be taken into consideration in order for um, Susan to establish whether it's something she might safely be able to do um, if she was comfortable doing that. Oh, that's really thank you Olivia that's, that's great so the nice thing is that she can get involved if she's got the correct knowledge skills and experience which is exactly right so um and I, I I know you talked about patient group directives really important isn't it really to be covered under the patient group directive and I've just signed my patient group directive to give the flu vaccine at my local hospital but it's quite specific isn't it it's only related to I'm only allowed to give flu vaccinations in my hospital to staff who work in the hospital I can't go to a GP surgery and help them out for example it's quite specific isn't it yeah, yeah, it will be quite, it will be tailored to you, it will be written to you and it will be to a kind of group of patients in a certain narrowly defined way, um, okay. which is why it's quite suited to vaccination campaigns, obviously not, not other sorts of medicines. It's always worth checking out with your employer who'd be setting up that PGD to establish what you can and can't do. Yeah, and there's that medicines as entitlement. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, so that's really important useful on our website isn't there which I found really useful because I didn't know before I started working in this you know for the HCPC what the medicine entitlements were for different professions I found that really useful. Yeah so we've got 15 different professions there's lots of different medical entitlements for each and every one so if you typed in medical entitlements onto our uh, website you'd find that page with all of the information including uh, the table Kim's referring to with a tick list of which profession has which rights at this moment in time. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. So a couple of things about this. I think that's very straightforward, isn't it, really? A couple of things about this, really. And I think there is um, there was a lovely article in the British Medical Journal um, not long ago in October uh, talking about the fact that they're expanding the list of people who are going to deliver the flu vaccination. And ultimately, I'm sure that will be applying for the to the COVID uh, vaccination as well, which will be a very exciting thing that we're all looking forward to helping along with. Um, we put out a statement. Um, only last week or the week before, uh, just saying that we support the measures to enable other healthcare workers to to administer flu and COVID-19 vaccinations. So exactly like Olivia said, it's really, really important that other people are involved because it's going to be a massive project, isn't it really? Um, and I think what I wanted to point out was the current consultation, Olivia. So this is really important as well. People can get involved with this, can't they? Yeah, so, so NHS um, England are currently consulting on a number of measures which you can see on the screen uh, relating to a, a small number of professions um, to expand the current medical entitlements of, of these professions. So uh, the NHS consultations are the first step um, in a several stage process to getting uh, changes to the law that control these areas and ultimately uh, expanding uh, the roles of these professionals. So if that's something you're particularly interested in or it relates to your profession, uh, definitely something that you want to, might want to get involved in and the links obviously there on the screen. Yeah, it's really important actually to get involved in consultations. Really, really useful. Brilliant. So and just a quick reminder to us all. Have you had your flu vaccine? If you haven't, try and get sorted out through, through occupational health, through your where you work or try and get it through your employer. It's really, really important. Um, never more than this year. And particularly because we know the health frontline healthcare workers such as yourself are more at risk of getting flu because you have more contact with patients who might potentially have flu. So do drop and get your flu vaccine. It isn't compulsory, but, you know, it's recommended. So there we go. So um, got another one here, Olivia. So I'm Abdullah now. I'm a registered paramedic. I'm working in a GP practice visiting housebound patients. Um, and one of my patients becomes unwell and I call an ambulance. When the ambulance arrives, the attending vehicle doesn't have a paramedic as part of the crew. Can I now administer the drugs that I normally would do if I was acting in the role of a paramedic employed by the ambulance service? So I'm in a different role now, aren't I? I'm employed um, actually in a GP role that's a fantastic role for paramedics trying to keep patients out of hospital and going to visit patients in their own home. So can I do that? Is, is that allowed Olivia? Yes yeah, so <laughs> we get a lot of questions like this maybe not this ex exact scenario but lots of variants of it mm -hmm. um, 
sometimes mostly from paramedics, but it does it does depend. Um, paramedics, I think, in particular, because as a profession, there's a very uh, clear sort of traditional role in an ambulance where you perhaps are used to having a certain level of uh, equipment, uh, drugs immediately available, uh, and might feel quite comfortable knowing how and when you're able to use them. Um, but if you go outside of that role, outside of an ambulance service, you, you might be in a completely different uh, situation in terms of what you're able yeah. to access, which entirely understandably might be um, might be quite anxiety inducing. So we we do get a lot of questions, um, but obviously in other professions as well, we get these sorts of questions too. What happens when my scope of practice is uh, non non traditional? I think the key point here is um, understanding um, what what the expectations are being placed on you by your employer in that current role. Yeah. Our expectation is um, if you're in a scope, a more reduced scope of practice than what you're used to, because that's what's set out in your job description by your employer, uh, then we would expect you to operate within that more uh, reduced scope of practice. And we wouldn't be holding you to um, what you may be able to do in a different role. And that's because your employer uh, might have set restrictions on your practice for a reason. There might not be uh, an indemnity insurance arrangement in place to cover that more advanced oh, yes. scope of practice. Um, your training might not be up to date with um, particular uh, drugs or sort of practice that no longer relates to that current role. Um, so I think the key thing here to advise um, Abdullah is just to make sure to check with your employer about exactly what it is that they are expecting um, you to do, what that indemnity arrangement in place is. Uh, because if you are put in this sort of hypothetical scenario, uh, and you don't know the answer, then it might be uh, quite difficult for you to establish what your current, what is currently expected of you. Um, but just to kind of, I guess, stress that from the HDPC's point of view, we would be um, only expecting you to operate within your your current job description. We wouldn't be holding you to um, a higher standard or a, an entirely different role if that's something that you're not expected to do in that current role. Yeah, that's really reassuring, actually, Olivia, and I think it's really important, isn't it? I think it's sort of the, the sort of thing you need to think about before it happens, isn't it? <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's hard to think of every scenario, but you do need to think that through, don't you? Because when it happens, you're put in a really difficult position. Can I help? Do you know what I mean? It's it's quite tough, isn't it, really? So thank you. Thank you for that. That's brilliant. We do get quite a lot of those, don't we, Olivia, about scope of practice, particularly for paramedics. Um, so that's really, really useful. Yeah. OK, so, oops, sorry, my apologies. I can't quite click onto my screen. So these are the questions you can ask yourself. And I think they're really, really useful um, to sort of think about the questions that you ask yourself. So it's all about, remember those three things, but the two the first ones, skills and knowledge to carry out the activity safely and effectively. Have you completed the training? So with my flu vaccination, I completed online training on anaphylaxis. I've done training, I've done a quiz, um, I had to pass a test, you know, to make sure that I was competent. Um, is the activity restricted by law, which again, Olivia was talking about those, that table on our website, which might be quite useful. And do I need to be registered with another healthcare regulator? Now, this is an interesting one. Olivia, you were telling me um, yesterday when we were chatting that some people are regulate are some professionals are double dual registered, dual registered with two regulators, like paramedics and nurses, you said, and yeah. yeah, I think paramedics and nurses, I think I've seen ODPs and nurses. There's, there's often a, a lot of different mixes of different um, different professional titles. Some individuals get training from more than one profession and therefore, yeah, sometimes are regulated by a different body as well, um, which is interesting. And no, Thank you very much. That's lovely. And does your professional indemnity, you already talked about speaking to your insurance employer, that's insurance cover, that's really important. OK, one one more uh, case study. So this is a very topical one as well. I'm Samantha. I'm an operating department pr practitioner and I've been redeployed to critical care during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm very happy to help out as much as I can, and I, but I'm worried I may make a mistake. And I think that's a really common one that you had a lot of. And I think the first thing that both we both want to say is thank you very much for yeah. being both adaptable, committed to the NHS and willing to really put yourself out there and help others without thinking of, you know, sticking, sticking in your current role. So I think that's absolutely amazing. Um, but Olivia, we did get quite a few of those, didn't we? And, and what, what did you say? Yeah, I think particularly in the um, the first wave, uh, we're probably going to get some more again now, um, probably our most highest uh, kind of requested question was something along these lines of, Either, uh, it, fortunately in this case, uh, 
Samantha is kind of happy to help. I think, unfortunately, in some cases, um, we've also had questions from registrants put in perhaps a more difficult situation, um, perhaps being asked to move into a role that they don't feel is within their scope of practice. I guess what's key for us, um, kind of given away the answer, but it, it's coming back <laughs> to what is within your scope of practice and yeah. how we define scope of practice is your the limit of your skills, knowledge and experience. So we don't have a set um, defined scope of practice for each of our professions, as sort of mentioned in the uh, previous example, you might be in a really uh, non-traditional uh, role for your profession uh, and we wouldn't stop professionals doing that because we always want to encourage our professions to to develop as long as they're still able to practice uh, safely and effectively I think that's really key yeah. and so if you're going into a new role uh, you're, you might find that you've got lots of transferable skills and you're able to um, adapt quite quickly in other cases you might find that you need um, a lot more training or support from your employer or some supervision um, just to make sure that you are able to practice safely and effectively in that new environment. Uh, now, obviously, with a COVID, with a pandemic going on, what training and support might be available that might look different to what you would expect in a sort of ordinary, like normal circumstance because of the pressures. But it's still really important that your um, your employer or those support structures in place, if you're uh, not employed um, directly, are still making sure and giving you the assurances you need to um, to practice safely and effectively and giving you that support you need. Yeah, thanks Olivia. And this one's a bit close to my heart really because when I was um, working in the, in the pandemic, uh, I worked with some really good ODPs who'd been um, redeployed as I had to uh, ITU. And actually, um, particularly shout out to Ian, I, I don't, I'm sure he's not on this webinar, but he was amazing. He was an ODP who, um, it soon became clear that he had skills in things like medication administration, drug, drawing up drugs, calculating drug doses, so that he will far, was far ahead of many of us. And so he found his place actually in the drug room, um, helping us do all that stuff and it, it was very, he was so slick and so quick and so competent that he was quickly uh, used every day in the drug cupboard. Apart from that, the drug cupboard was very cold uh, and he was actually used to being a little bit cold because he was used to working in theatres. So we all would go in there and be freezing and he'd be absolutely fine, really strangely. But shout out to Ian and all the other people who've been um, redeployed uh, into different areas during the COVID pandemic. So thank you very much. But that's a brilliant answer. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, so a particular also a shout out. We've got some My HCPC stories on our website and I found three that were very much related to this whole issue of being redeployed and I wanted to do a shout out to them really. Nick was a paramedic and teaching fellow um, and he spoke honestly about his COVID experiences transferring patients between wards um, and Stuart was an ODP exactly as we talked about and he worked in a COVID positive ITU and then Beth was a speech and language therapist who got um, involved in oxygen running teams to make sure there was enough oxygen in the hospital so a really important job as well so we have some really good stories and again if you want to write your story um, please contact us and Holly will write your story for you and get it published on our website which I think is really exciting so um, I wanted to just point out really that we had some fantastic, uh, what the sort of things Olivia's been talking about on our COVID hub. So we have a, an, an area of our website which is called the COVID hub and it's got some, some really good information really about scope of practice, which clearly became quite an issue for lots of registrants straight away. Um, and that information is up there for you now. And what the key to the whole thing is making sure that you can perform safely and effectively for patients, obviously. So um, before we, I think we might have a look. Is there any questions coming through, Holly? I'm not sure. I haven't, I'm not very good at multi-skilling. So are there any questions coming through on the chat box? There are, so there are a few questions coming through on Slido that aren't uh, coming up on Teams. So I'm just, okay. um, I'm just kind of looking at those now. Um, so one, one is a, um, Hi, I'm an OTP and I've been asked to work in an ICU um, taking patients. Where do we stand legally um, if the critical network will not give us um, training? Uh, I'll, try, I'll take one in turn rather than <laughs> rather than this through them all. And um, so I think unfortunately we are aware of some situations where regiments are being put in really difficult positions where they're being encouraged um, or more than encouraged to go work in different areas than perhaps is is outside of their sure. kind of comfort zone or their scope of practice and their employer is perhaps not providing them with any training uh, we are going to be moving on to reporting concerns and that might, i think might give some really helpful tools around 
how you might be able to approach those conversations because it is, it is really important that yeah. you feel um, comfortable in your scope of practice you feel that you're still able to work safely and effectively uh, and your employer should be equipping you to meet um, those standards I, I appreciate that might that might not be the reality um, but it's really important that when that isn't the case that you are uh, reporting those concerns and um, if need be perhaps setting sort of boundaries to make sure you're still practicing safely and um, so I'm sure we'll come on to that in a bit more detail but happy to pick it up a little bit more yeah. Um, just to then, say, Olivia, that, that really links up to the, the slide that's on your screen at the moment, doesn't it, about raising concerns. Yeah. We'll look at some of the areas of that in a second. That's right, what you say, yeah. Any others, Olivia? Yeah, so one, another from um, an ODP asked me if they can work in um, schools uh, as a nurse or um, administer, and administer vaccines or give advice on sexual health education. Uh, so I guess coming back to my point that we yeah. don't restrict the scope of practice of our professions if... Um, you felt that that was within your scope of practice so you were suitably trained and experienced to perform that role um, and you uh, weren't infringing on um, anything that's restricted by law so the nurse role for example there are certain protected titles regulated by uh, the nurse and midwifery council um, i don't know off the top of my head if that is simply nurse or another version of nurse kim might know the answer being an NMC i don't know actually either sorry <laughs> so it would be it would be checking if you would have to be registered but with the nmc and also take on that role but the elements of the role around providing uh sexual health education or um working in, in that sort of capacity uh would be for you to determine based on what's required of the training and experience in terms of administering a vaccine that comes on to my earlier point around uh, medical entitlements uh, somebody's raised in the comment how odps has recently been a change in law to allow them to administer vaccines under occupational health schemes which has very recently come in with with government changes so there are now more mechanisms for um, odps to administer vaccines so you might be able to legally do so that way yeah. um I just maybe we'll, I can check if there are any more coming in. Okay, um, we'll we'll carry on. Yeah, and we'll come back. Thank you. We'll come back to questions in a second, but thank you ever so much, everybody. That's great. So this um, really links to the question, the, what, exactly what you said, because we thought this might come up about raising concerns. It's really important that you know that if you are concerned about, for example, as one of the um, registrants who asked that question is concerned about scope of practice and being asked to do something outside of your scope of practice, you, it is important that you raise this as a concern and it is, it is a requirement of all of us professionals, I'm also uh, regulated to raise concerns. So with there's some really, really good stuff on the NHS employers website, which has all of the um, four countries information about how to raise concerns. They, they put up those six things as six things that are really important for you. And I think they're exactly right. So familiarise yourself with the raising concerns policy. There was one everywhere you work. Understand how to do it. Find out who to talk to. How you escalate it if you don't get what you want and, and what you're concerned about. You don't feel you're taken seriously. No way you can seek independent help. We're going to come to that in a second. Um, and there's guidance for staff outside England. So there is there are some free, free fantastic resources. There is Protect, uh, which used to be called, or oh, Olivia, you'll, you'll have to tell me, I hear the Public Concern at Work Organisation. That's right, I've got it right. There's the Citizens Advice Bureau, and there's also an organisation called Speak Up, which is free confidential advice. So really useful. And again, in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, there are those organisations as well. I'm not going to read them out, but we will send around the slides. You go on the NHS Employers website. The links are all there on the NHS, on the NHS Employers website, which I think is quite useful. Um, freedom to Speak Up. Freedom to Speak Up Guardians. There's over 600 Freedom to Speak Up Guardians um, in the UK, uh, sorry, in England. Um, they actually arose from Sir Robert Francis, who wrote a Freedom to Speak Up report in 2015, and that arose from um, the uh, Francis report published in 2013. So um, Sir Robert Francis noticed that it was really difficult to speak up in an organisation, and he wanted to put in place a structure to enable us to be supported if we want to speak up, and that's what the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians are. Now, there are, as I said, about 600 across England. They aren't, interestingly, I had thought they were all in the NHS, but actually about 70% of them are in the NHS and 30% in other organisations. So there's a lot of private organisations that you may work for, for example, hospices, MIND and, and 
I, who I used to work for, the General Medical Council, we have Freedom to Speak Up Guardians and they often have ambassadors under them if they're a big organisation. So there's like a pool of ambassadors who you can go and speak to. So they're fantastic and they are independent, quite senior people who have to refer up to the board if there are any concerns about freedom to speak, about speaking up and raising concerns. So do, you know, give them a shout. They are really useful. But do you know who you, yours is? Do you know who your Freedom to Speak Up Guardian is? You know, it's important to find out who they are. There is a list on the Freedom to Speak Up Gar National Guardian's Office website that you can look up who your Freedom to Speak Up Guardian is. That will be really, really important. OK, I'm not going to go to the app there. So any more questions, Olivia? I know you've been looking, you've been looking at your phone, you've been looking at the Slido app. Is there anything else that's coming up that you want us to ask? Uh, somebody's asked us if there's a bridging course for ODPs in nursing. I assume this means training to take someone from an ODP to a nurse. Uh, if that is the case, um, nursing training is managed and regulated by the Nurse and Midwifery Council, so yeah. it would need to be a course approved by them, um, which I, I don't know the answer to if, if they exist. Um, I don't um, think they, they, I'm not sure if they do, but certainly the NMC website would give you the, and you can ask the NMC, but also um, there are often courses going on in the hospitals you work in. So after the first wave of COVID, the hospital I worked in laid on a week long training program, which it, which was fantastic for all the redeployed staff so that we could be upskilled um, in some of the really key things about caring for patients, basically, so that we're more prepared for the second wave. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure, Olivia. OK, yeah. Olivia. Yeah. yeah, and then we've had a few um, comments, I think, just building on what you've just spoken about the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian. Somebody suggesting that there are um, guardian services in um, LHBs, my acronym brain has gone, uh, <laughs> local, health, local health boards in Wales yes, as well. Um, or if oh, you're in a trade union such as Unison, then you can speak to your trade union rep. Um, so I think that's really helpful. No, actually, uh, that's a really good point as well. Yeah. Yeah, just trying to see if there's anything I've missed. Somebody's asking about um, fitness to practice concern, I think, and whether they can well, whether they can work. I think it would depend on the, the particular status of that fitness to practice um, case. I'm happy to uh, take that individual who's raised that, con uh, that question's contact details so I can check with uh, fitness to practice colleagues the status of that and what impact that's perhaps having on their on their practice. Lovely. Thank you, Olivia. That's brilliant. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, so the second part of standard three uh, has quite a lot about knowledge and skills and keeping your knowledge and skills up to date, which also covered sort of in the CPD guidance as well. Um, what I thought we'd focus on for the next sort of few minutes is just a little bit about feedback. You must ask for feedback and use it to improve your practice, something that quite a lot of us are, are not fantastic about. So I thought it would be really useful just to unpick that just a little bit. Um, and I wanted to show you a, a great slide that I found, which talks about feedback being seen as a gift or an attack. Um, now, it's quite difficult sometimes to see it as a gift. Um, we often see it as a personal attack. And I think that's that's the concern, isn't it? If you've got that mindset, it becomes very difficult to unpick that. So it requires that mindset shift mindset shift from seeing it as a, an attack to seeing it as a gift um, and it's not an attack on you as a person that's the big thing really that you need to get over really because it's, it's quite tough isn't it really I um, I think the really brave thing for everybody to do is to ask for feedback so last week I was doing the flu clinic I talked about and my colleague who's in the next door room to me could hear me bringing patients in and giving bringing sorry, patients in staff in and giving them their flu jab and for some staff it was quite um we had quite a long conversation because they were actually struggling quite a lot at work uh, and I did get behind on a couple of flu vaccinations um, and actually it became I was quite worried about that so I asked the my colleague if she felt it was a concern and she actually said no 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 I think actually when you said because as patients walked in I said oh I'm really sorry to have kept you waiting most of them just said oh don't worry I had a, had a nice sit down so she said you know don't worry about being late slightly it's more important that you deal with each pa each staff member as they come along and that was quite useful so not seeing it as an attack asking for feedback at every opportunity you can is really really useful but it's tough it's a tough one we can also ask our clients or our patients for feedback and there's many ways of doing that I've just put a couple of things up there NHS choices lots of people ask for feedback on Twitter patient opinion friends and family tests there's lots of ways of asking point asking for feedback but remember it's not just about asking for feedback it's actually about acting on that feedback so turning it into a continuous improvement activity or turning it into something that's really positive for patients really really useful so anything else? Any more questions? Olivia, I'll come to you 
in a second, but I just want to point out a couple of things to you about the COVID hub. We've already talked about the importance of that and the really good stuff that's on our website for you, for you to see, really. It's really, really useful. Um, I just want to promote our next uh, webinar before we're not going to finish yet, but just our next webinar is standard four. It's about delegation and it's on Friday, the 27th of November at 1 p.m. We're trying different times of the day because we wondered if different times of the way day worked for different people. But Olivia, is there any more questions? Yeah, I've had a couple come in. One um, on Teams on the Q&A there. Um, oh. I'm a first contact um, physio. I hope that's what FCP means. If, again, if my acronym was wrong, <laughs> then I'm sorry. Um, asking, oh, let me just lost the question. I've moved on to, oh, here you go. Um, first contact physio and primary care. If I pass a patient on to a medical colleague, do I have a responsibility to ensure that they've been seen? Uh, so I think this ties in perhaps more so with some of our standards and conduct performance and ethics around delegation. Yeah, which next just, time, yes, but we can, next, yeah. spoilers for next time. But, um, but it, I guess in, yeah, in short, um, so our standards talk about how, um, whilst it's not quite delegation, um, sort of the principles of when you hand over to somebody, um, making sure that when you delegate work, um, you're only giving it to someone who's got the knowledge, skills and experience to carry that out safely and effectively. Um, and in the context of delegation, which perhaps is, is less relevant here if the medical colleague is more senior, um, you would still provide appropriate supervision and support. Yeah. Um, so I think the key um, key here is is having confidence that when you do hand over um, to somebody else, um, if that person is more junior, then thinking about whether you need to be continuing to provide support. If they're more senior, um, you perhaps will have more confidence that they are. Um, yeah. They do have the skills, knowledge and experience to do so, but making sure that you've um, you're passing on the relevant information to them and tying in with some of our other standards about how you you need to work um, effectively with colleagues and you need to um, share information with colleagues involved in the care and treatment um, of service users that you're providing care to. So they would be the key things um, to take and account let's, of. Let's, that's a great, we'll unpick that for the next time as well. Yeah, the next more, I think that's more a great detail. One. Thank you so much for that, actually. That's a great case study, so thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, and just the last one, the scene is somebody's asking, they're an occupational therapist and they've been nominated to lecture in a physiotherapy uh, degree and with physiotherapy students. Right. Uh, so in, that's in short, um, there aren't restrictions in our standards that would prevent um, an individual from one profession from training or supervising or supporting students from another profession. Again, it comes back to scope of practice. So do you have the required skills, uh, knowledge and experience in order to give those physiotherapy students what they need. Uh, and our education team, they have um, standards that they, um, education programmes that are approved by us have to meet. And that includes um, standards about the knowledge and experience of practice educators um, and educators on programmes. So that might be uh, something that you'd like to refer to. I actually think it would be a great, it's a great honour to be asked to lecture. So I think actually you should say, yes, please. Thank you very much. That's a great honour to be asked. It's really, really nice, particularly from a different professional group. I think it's absolutely lovely. Um, OK, sorry, Olivia, you're all right. No, we've got not, we've got more coming in. I don't, if there's another Q&A a bit at the end. I we'll have a little bit at the end while they're doing their yeah. voting. Is that all right? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So just what we've covered today, just briefly keeping within your scope and maintaining your knowledge and skills and looking at feedback. So I'm going to ask you um, while Olivia, we'll, Olivia and I will chat uh, about the other questions while we ask you some questions, if that's all right. So we really need to know whether this was useful. OK, so there's no, there's no point us doing it unless it's really useful to you. So I'm going to ask you some questions while Olivia and I just go through some some questions, if that's all right. So a bit of voting on the screen while we're listening to the answer, if that's all right. So there's, there's, there's a few questions. So after this session, how would you rate your understanding of standard three? Is it better? Oh, I hope so. Or is it worse? Is OK if it is? Just please put your honest truth. We're, we're OK with it either way. Um, and Olivia, go for it. Any more questions? Put you on the spot, sorry. Oh, you might be on mute. I am on mute. Sorry. I've, played the, I've done the rookie mistake of, I think, <laughs> it's not a Teams call, is it, if somebody's not accidentally on mute? Exactly. Um, so just someone that's come in, um, unfortunately, so somebody has stated that their trust has said that they were going to be struck off if any mistakes were made during a pandemic, um, which this is a very bold statement, which I think is an yes. understatement. Um, and it's really unfortunate that uh, the trust is speaking to uh, kind of their employees in that way. Obviously, Pressures are high, emotions are high, and that perhaps might be why it's communicated that way. I mean, certainly 
from our end, there's lots of guidance on our website around how we are continuing to regulate during the pandemic, what we're what we are kind of doing to keep in mind the circumstances surrounding the pandemic in all of our work. So definitely the context in which you all are practicing in and the immensely challenging um, circumstances um, are at the forefront of our minds and are underpinning sort of how we continue to regulate in this time. So um, it's certainly not helpful for employers to be making those kinds of statements, um, certainly even if any a referral is made to us, there are lots of steps that we go through. Um, a tiny number are referred to us, and then an even tinier number um, are um, lead to to a strike off. So it's I think it's certainly some not I don't think a helpful way for an employer to be engaging its its staff right now. Um, happy very to tough. yeah, very very tough. I think it would be a, a time that if somebody said that to me, then I would go and talk to somebody about it. And I would probably seek yeah. out somebody like the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian to give me some support in that situation and have a chat yeah. and and um, raise it a little bit higher. Yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. Olivia. That's a tough one. I've put up another question now. What do you think of the HCPC? When you think of us, what come, word comes to mind? And there's lots of words coming to mind. So thank you very much. For that. I'm going to hold that one if that's all right. And Olivia, is there any more? While well, I just put one more, I'm going to put two more Two more questions. So, how likely are you to recommend? How likely are you to recommend this training to your colleagues? So, from naught to ten. Sorry, to Olivia. Is any more? Are we going for any more questions? Yeah, I've, I've just published a few. If you, I've have got the chat and um, the Q and A bar um, on you. Teams, then you can see some comments. I think some are just responding to some answers before. I think related to the physio handing over to. Oh, fantastic. Um, a medical sort of ma making sure you have a record of the when you did hand over to that person. I think what I might That's have missed um, reading back on it is uh, the guarantee, making sure that somebody has been seen. So it's that concern if you hand it over to a, a more senior colleague and then they aren't seen. Um, so it's yes. really important you do keep records of any decisions that you um, that you make um, and that you're making sure those decisions are uh, kind of risk informed. So. Um, yeah. Our standards do talk through if not putting somebody at unacceptable risk. So if you if you suspect that they're not going to get seen, then they might need to take action. But taking those uh, keeping those records is really important, so you can use an evidence that you have done uh, kind of what you've done. And once they're handed over, obviously to a colleague, um, that colleague um, will be responsible for that, yeah. that individual. But that's really useful. So we're all solving each other's problems, which is always the key, <laughs> isn't it? Really, that's really wonderful. I'd love, I'd love that. That's, thank you very much for your contributions. That's brilliant. It's really nice. And it's nice to see that you're using the Q and A on Slido, actually, which maybe is a little bit easier to use than the the other one. So we we don't actually mind which you use. That's absolutely. Well. Thank you for that one. And one last question um, before um, we we sort of finish. And so, any while you're doing that, any last questions, Olivia? Just some, somebody said thank you on Slido, which is always nice to hear and that they're going to recommend to their colleagues to sign up, which is yeah, always nice to hear. I'm hope if I have missed anyone, I'm kind of I'm looking no, at Slido and I'm looking at um, teams. If I have missed anyone, uh, I think our contact details will be passed if on. not Holly will. So yeah. oh, there'll be a we are totally happy and Olivia, you know, your team is very happy to take questions and queries, isn't it? Exactly like the ones you're getting and exactly like the ones we discussed today. Um, and the nice thing about this in some ways is that when you get queries, you can pay, maybe signpost them to some of the, the answers that we've given today, which is really even nicer. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. OK, so thank you very much for that. That's the last um, slide, the last voting. And I'm sorry, it is a bit of voting, so I do apologise for that, but it really helps us tremendously. So that is our contact details if you want to take a picture of it. Um, but we, as I said, the lovely Holly will send it round for you and we are always happy to take questions and queries. That is our job at the HCPC to respond to and to support you as healthcare professionals uh, in the really tough jobs that you're doing, particularly at the moment. And I have think it's fantastic that you've take, taken the time in your busy afternoons just to join us um, for this session, which is really nice. And we wanted to end on a thank you because Clap for Carers isn't going on at the moment, um, but we are certainly thankful for everything that you're doing, um, supporting patients and getting us all through this. So thank you very much for your time and energy. Please put anything else. Olivia and I and Holly will stay on the line just briefly, um, but if you want to leave now, then that's absolutely fine. Um, thank you very much for your time. Take care. So I think Olivia, we might just stay on the line just to see if there are any more questions, just to see um, yeah. an actual fact. Um, I can see, I can't, I can see.
yeah, I can see they're probably isn't anymore. Shall we? We'll go yeah. off now and uh, I'll give you a ring in a second. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much, Olivia <laughs> and Holly. Take care.